Welcome back to another episode of Drunk Video Game History. I'm really excited because tonight is the start of a new chapter for Drunk Video Game History. From here on out, I should always, always be doing specialty cocktails that are curated just for the game. And tonight is the first one. We're doing Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance, and the cocktail I've prepared is going to be called the Dream Drop. I didn't do anything fancy. When you see me over by the fire, it's gonna be in my signature glass over ice. But this is how I think is gonna be the preferred method of serving. Again, this is my cocktail, so I can do it however I want to. It's gonna be really easy. Orange liqueur, vanilla vodka. That's it, one shot of each. But what makes it really awesome is gonna be how it's presented. This shot glass has a fun story behind it. Time of Judgment is an uh, White Wolf at the time, now an Onyx Path role-playing game company. In 1999, which may be ancient history for some of you guys, they did an event at Gen Con called the Time of Judgment, and they gave out shot glasses. They had an open bar, and I got incredibly sick. I could barely drive home the next day. So one shot of orange liqueur, and then I'm going to take the shot glass, uh, invert the shot glass and the bottom of your glass. Now I had to try several glasses I had at home before I found one that was good for this. So this is the best one I found. Now we're going to invert the whole glass and most of that liquid should stay in that glass. Now we're going to take our vanilla vodka or pour in and again about a shot. Here's the fun part. This is going to be my recommended serving for this drink. For a lot of you guys out there watching, you can probably do this a lot more delicately than I can. There you go. I think it's fun. I think it's a fun way to drink it. So that's it. It's a fun drink. Uh, the dream drop. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put it over ice. I'm gonna have a couple more. And after you see me over by the fire, I'll have my signature glass and have some more of these over ice. It'll be great. So please join me over by the fire. We'll talk about Kingdom Hearts Dream Drop Distance. Thanks for joining me for Dream Drop Distance. Dream Drop Distance has a really odd open. It starts with Break, and he's kind of looking around this room Ienzo's there, Evan is there, and it's like it opens right after Birth by Sleep, which is weird because chronologically it doesn't take place anywhere near Birth by Sleep. Chronologically, and Kingdom Hearts 3 is the sequel to Dream Drop Distance because this series has really odd naming conventions. The way the story is told through Dream Drop Distance is kind of bizarre. Bragg, Evan, Ienzo. Evan and Ienzo are passed out face down. Bragg is like screaming at somebody off camera and we can't really see who it is. We figure out pretty quickly it's Xehanort. And Xehanort like screams at him and he's like, I'm not Xehanort. I am Ansem now. And then he stabs him in the chest with his keyblade. We find out this is how Vexen, Zigbar, Zexion, and Ansem Seeker of Darkness um, and Zimnus, they all become nobodies. I guess Ansem Seeker of Darkness isn't a, no isn't a nobody, he's a heartless, but yes. This is how all of this happens immediately after Birth by Sleep. Again, yeah, it's a weird movie thing to open this game. So that's the opening movie. And then it cuts over to Sora and Riku. They're standing in front of Master Yen Sid. The naming conventions in this game are really odd. There's lots of anagrams. Yen Sid, if you rearrange the letters, it's actually just backwards. You get Disney, kind of a nod back to Disney. They're standing there. Yen Sid declares to Sora and Riku that it's time for them to take the Mark of Mastery exam. Now at first, I, I really have mixed feelings about this whole, it's time for you guys to take the Mark of Mastery exam. On one hand, if you look at their accomplishments, especially Sora, he has saved the entire universe completely and fully, twice. Fully. He has defeated Xehanort's Nobody in Kingdom Hearts 2, and he defeated Xehanort's Heartless in Kingdom Hearts 1. Why is he being told he has to be a Keyblade? And why is he having to take this weird test for Master Yensei? So that's, you know, that's number one. But number two, if you play Birth by Sleep and you see how Terra, Aqua, and Ventus handle their Keyblades, you know that Sora and Riku know nothing about their Keyblades. Aqua, Ventus, and Terra can do things like turn their Keyblades into armor. They protect themselves. And that'll become important later. When I talk about Birth by Sleep, the things they can do with their Keyblades are amazing. And in my Birth by Sleep video, which will probably be a couple of videos from now, it will be, you guys should be blown away when I describe the things they do. I, when, when they, at one scene, I was like, what is going on here? I didn't even know a Keyblade could do that. 
So yeah, it's wild, it's weird. They need more training in how to use their Keyblades. They don't need to be thrown into this mark of mastery exam. But then we get to actually what the exam is. In Birth by Sleep, Aqua and Terra are gonna take their mark of mastery exam. What their mark of mastery exam is, is to just beat some balls around a room. Master Ericus, and if you rearrange the letter for Ericus, you get square. Master Ericus conjures some balls, and Terra and Aqua beat the balls around the room. And then, and Terra calls upon the power of darkness. Aqua doesn't. Aqua is a Keyblade Master. Through the whole game, you play as Keyblade Master Aqua, if you play as Aqua. For Sora and Riku's Mark of Mastery exam, they have to dive into five separate sleeping worlds and release them from their slumber. It's the most complicated Keyblade Mark of Mastery exam that I think ever has been in the history of Mark of Mastery exams. And they have the least amount of formal Keyblade training. So again, really odd design choices here. Uh, there are, so I mentioned sleeping worlds. There are worlds of light and worlds of darkness. Apparently there's also sleeping worlds. Sora has unlocked worlds in the previous games. Some of the worlds that he's unlocked, instead of being completely fixed, were just mostly fixed. Those that were just mostly fixed are still in a deep slumber as per the game, and you have to go through and you have to awaken them. How would you awaken them, you may ask? That might be a very interesting thing to do. You awaken them by playing through their Disney plot and pointing your keyblade at their keyhole. Just like every other Kingdom Hearts game. This game does introduce a brand new enemy type for us. They're called Dream Eaters. There are two kinds of Dream Eaters. There are Spirits and there are Nightmares. Spirits are good and they are Pokemon. And you can collect them and you can use them and you can battle them and they will battle against other Dream Eaters. And there are the bad ones and they're called Nightmares and you just fight them. That's the primary enemy type in this game. They really are a weird aesthetic though. Uh, they have their own little symbol which will become important later just like Unversed and Nobodies and Heartless have their own symbols. It's just an odd design choice though, because they look really, really like Pokemon. They're very colorful, they're very bright. Their color palettes are super bright and colorful, where Nobodies have this very white look to them. They're very, they're like the anti-Heartless. Heartless have this very dark, like in rounded corners. Unversed have very sharp edges. The Dream Eaters are all super fantasy bright. It's really jarring. It really doesn't fit with the aesthetic of Kingdom Hearts. So you play through the game, you can get these Dream Eaters to help you, and you play through as Sora and as Riku. You dive into the first world, the first world is Destiny Islands. You uh, fight the tutorial boss, which is Ursula. It's a pretty basic, easy fight. There's a big storm, and you guys are separated. After that, what actually happens is Sora is pulled deeper by Xehanort, and that's where most of the plot happens. Again, there's only five worlds in this game, really. Um, the first place you go is Traverse Town, and in Traverse Town, you end up with The World Ends With You people. And The World Ends With You characters are great. I highly recommend The World Ends With You. It's a really fun game series. It's out on Switch. I really enjoy it. I, Switch is the definitive way to play it, I think. Uh, I would probably wait for a sale if you haven't played it by now. There's some extra content on the Switch version, though. It's great. The music alone, the soundtrack, look it up on YouTube. It's fantastic. It's very fun to play with a world of a few characters in Traverse Town. And again, I'm not going to go through the Disney plots, so. though. There's no real Kingdom Hearts plot elements in the Disney worlds. But in between them, some important stuff happens. For example, Lee wakes up. Lee is Axel's somebody. Lee wakes up and he finds Dylan, Evan, Alias, and Ianzo. But his, when he was a nobody, Syax was his buddy. That was his like really good friend. And he can't find Isa, so he goes off on this journey to find him. While, and Sora and Riku really aren't involved in a lot of the plot of this game that's going on. In between, when you guys are diving through the worlds, you go through and you get these cutscenes that involve Axel and he's okay for example he goes to Master Against It. There's a there's a bit where Maleficent captures Queen Minnie and she saves herself. It really has nothing to do with the Kingdom Hearts plot at all. It kind of is what lets us get introduced to Lee. So Lee is there, he was looking for Issa, and Master Yin, he goes to Master Yin and he's like, will you train me? Master Yin is like, yes, I will train you. And Zimnis 
is back in this game. Xemnas is back in the game. Xehanort's back in Terra's body. And there's a new character who just comes up to harass Sora and Riku. It's supposed to be mysterious who it is, but it's young Xehanort. The problem that happens here is this game introduces time travel. So you play through a lot of the game, again, like most Kingdom Hearts games. The gameplay is wonderful, but they move most of the plot to the end. So you end up in the world that never was again. And I, I'm a big fan of the world that never was. I, I have good strong feelings about it. I enjoy playing with Roxas, having good combat potential there. And we find out the rules of time travel. The rules of time travel somehow involve you lose your memory when you time travel and a body can't time travel, but a heart can. So at one point, Xehanort lost his body and was just a heart. So he went back in time, talked to young Xehanort and told young Xehanort about time travel. So young Xehanort then time traveled to the future because his heart Heart remembered. And when Xehanort started Organization 13, what he did was put a little bit of himself into all of the members, nobodies. So then he could make an organization that was 13 Xehanort clones because of time travel. So him at 13 different points in his own timeline, all existing at the same time being Organization 13. That would be the 13 beings of darkness. In fact, at one point, Zigbar says something like, Psh, I'm half Xehanort already, haven't you noticed? And he has the yellow eyes. And when people are like, Aqua's been Norded, that's what they mean. So that whole meme about Aqua being Norded, that's what that is. Now you guys are in that club too. This game also retcons some things. For example, the whole thing about nobody's not having hearts. Because really, that was always really messy. Axel had feelings for, for Xion, for example. And in this, Sora actually straight out confronts Xemnas and is like, I know nobodies have hearts. And Xemnas tells him, you're pretty much right. When a nobody is initially created, it doesn't have a heart. But beings have to have a heart, so it calls out to its heart. So nobodies develop hearts very, very quickly in their life cycles. Also, nobodies are always going to be temporary shells. And you're always always they're always going to return to their somebodies which is a pretty big retcon but it's a very important plot point so like i mentioned earlier sora fell into a deeper sleep than riku and xehanort has actually taken the sleeping sora who is sleeping deeper and grabbed him if people were paying attention riku's outfit has the dream eater spirit symbol on it because he is also one of sora's dream eaters to protect him from xehanort i i don't know why you're supposed to make that logical leap but at the end they kind of say it In an effort to show how clever they were, it's kind of an interesting jump they do, and that happens. So as they, so they have to go in and rescue Sora from Xehanort and several other Xehanorts. There's like four and a half Xehanorts there. Old Xehanort is actually back. Like evil McWigglefingers from Birth by Sleep is there. Young Xehanort is there. Xemnas is there. Terra Xehanort is there. And Brag is there, or Zigbar. And they're trying to get Sora to get a piece of Xehanort inside of him. And that's pretty creepy. I don't know what Tetsuya Nomura has in mind there, but at core, Xehanort's plan is to try to put himself into little boys. That's really disturbing. If you're an old man and you want to put pieces of yourself into little boys, you need to get help. No plan is worth that. Hashtag the more you know. The gang shows up. Mickey shows up. Mickey casts Stop, which it's a great scene, except he's dealing with time travelers. And young Xehanort is an experienced time traveler, so Stop doesn't affect him for plot reasons. There's a battle. Riku has to battle Xehanort. And wow, I don't understand what happens in the game. But there is this that this battle, and when I talk about Kingdom Hearts three, I'm gonna say it's baby easy. Everything in the in the whole game is baby easy. Dream Drop Distance, if you use the balloon spell, is incredibly easy through the whole thing, except for this one fight versus Young Zero, and it's incredible incredibly difficult for no good reason. Actually, it's not for no good reason. It's because young Xehanort has this weird thing where he teleports around and puts up this wall thing. It's like this one fight was poorly playtested. Um, I know that has done very little to do with the plot of the game, but I still have like these scars from having to play this fight like five times. This reminds me, speaking of scars, this game has a drops a drop system. So I originally played this game on the DS. 
I play all the Kingdom Hearts games when they come out. I love the series. I go way back with the Kingdom Hearts series. When the reimagined versions came out, I decided just to devote a weekend to drinking lots of alcohol and playing this game without using Drop Me Nuts. Pro tip, use Drop Me Nuts. Buy all you can, equip them. They make this game a lot of fun and then you can control when you go back and forth between characters. It was one of the most frustrating experiences of my entire gaming career. Play this game without Drop Me Nuts. I was very appreciative that I was drinking lots and lots that weekend. The, the crew shows up, Lee shows up, he has to fight Syax. Lee realizes that Isa gave himself up back to be a nobody and his Syax again. And they were good friends, but now they're enemies. You realize that Xehanort's plan, he has plans within plans. It's kind of the, the Xanatos Gambit, if you're familiar with that. It's a trope. If you're not, you can look it up. It's one of my favorite tropes, actually. And Xehanort's really good at the Xanatos Gambit. So they get, they save Sora, but they realize Sora's still asleep. So Riku has to dive inside of Sora's heart, wake him up. Now, again, Kingdom Hearts is known for weird stuff, but this is where it gets really, really weird. He goes into Sora's heart, and we already know that Roxas is there, Ventus is there, Shion is there. He talks to them, that's fine, we get it. That's not that unusual. There's a Data version of Ansem the Wise there. Ansem, Data Ansem the Wise was put there by real Ansem the Wise with a whole bunch of research because real Ansem the Wise thought that Sora's heart was a great place to store a whole bunch of research data. Because apparently Sora's heart is like Dropbox now in the Kingdom Hearts universe. So that's what he did. He Dropboxed a whole bunch of his stuff, a whole bunch of his research data into Sora's heart. He gives it all to Riku and is like, hey, this research data may be good for you. Riku's even like, Data Ansem, what are you doing here? And Data Ansem says, oh, you, uh, yeah, this is, I've decided to put research data here because Sora's the only being ever in the history of the universe to stop being a heart while his nobody was still alive. So now I'm gonna use his heart like Dropbox. It's really bizarre. Like, I mean, Kingdom Hearts, I love the plot. I, I, I tell people all the time the plot is not that hard to follow, but yeah, that's some weird stuff. And that's it, they save Sora. Sora, Sora wakes up, Riku leaves with that data, that data will become important in Kingdom Hearts 3. And then there's a secret movie because of course there's a secret movie. The secret movie is very simple. All it is, the only thing we learn in the secret movie, Kairi can use a Keyblade. At the end of this game, we learn that Lee can manifest a Keyblade. Kingdom Hearts 3, we see Lee with his Keyblade, it gets broken. I'll talk about that more in the Kingdom Hearts 3 video, but really, the only thing that this Kingdom Hearts, most Kingdom Hearts secret movies have some cool stuff in them. This one's kind of a letdown. Mickey and Yen Sid talk. They talk about getting ready for the big battle that's coming up. It definitely leads into Kingdom Hearts 3, but there's no big plot things that are revealed. That's it. That's Dream Drop Distance. I hope you guys like the Dream Drop. Like I said, all of my drinks moving forward are going to be themed and custom made by me for whatever video it is, whatever game it is. I am, after I finish with Kingdom Hearts, I'm going to start in the Final Fantasy and I have no clue how I'm gonna do Final Fantasy because Final Fantasy 4 for example yeah I'm gonna be reaching for the Final Fantasy 4 cocktail but I'm glad you guys are here with me on this journey please like this video leave a comment about what you guys want to see next I'm really excited to do Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest those are some of my favorite game series but after that tell me what video game series you want to see me do the lore on and I will absolutely add it to my list to do. I plan on doing one of these a week forever, as long as my liver will hold out.